Hey everyone, it's Charlie Morgan here, and in this video I'm going to show you how to be right. I'm going to walk you through a method of thinking that you can implement to make better decisions, have more objectivity, be more rational, and basically solve problems. Okay, When you learn to think in this way that I'm going to teach you, you will be able to basically understand everything in its purest form, at least as pure as you can possibly get it, and you'll be able to make more educated, more informed decisions. The quality of your life and you know the, the quality of your existence is typically determined by the quality of your decisions and your ability to rapidly and quickly solve problems objectively. It probably is the single greatest tool you have as an entrepreneur is your mental comprehension mechanism and how you think and in this video, I'm going to walk you through how to process information, um, solve problems, make decisions, and become more objective, more rational. Um, and if you do it and you follow these instructions, your life will significantly improve. Because, you know, the way the world works is there is what we would call an objective reality, right? There is a, a pure form of truth in the world, right? And this is what we would call the objective, right? And your job really as a human being, if you want the quality of your life to be you know, drastically improved, is basically to line yourself up with the objective as close as possible. And so what you should want to do in life is not to necessarily be right or to not be wrong, but to find and understand the true nature of the world with whatever you're, or the true nature of whatever you're dealing with and basically line your paradigm and worldview, belief systems, models of thinking and character up with the truth. Because when you learn to do this and when you learn to line yourself up with the objective nature of the world, you can basically make decisions in alignment with it. Because if you make a decision out of alignment with what is true, then the universe is going to come and attack you for that, right? And so how do we define what is true? Like how do we actually establish the objective nature of the world, or in this case, the objective nature of a problem or a circumstance or a situation that we find ourselves in? Um, well, that's kind of the question. And if you can learn to do that, you can line yourself up with the objective nature of the world. And this is really the happiest place to live because when you know what is true, and when you when you know what is you know right and what is objectively true, um, you can start to make really really strong progress in your life. Um, a, a primary example of this would be um, smoking, right? So let's say that you know you were a human being in the '60s, right, where everyone's addicted to smoking, um, and a lot of people, right, because this is the problem. Okay, so. A lot of people thought smoking was actually good, right? So over here, you know, we have the subjective, okay? And, you know, in the, in the 60s when it came to smoking, like, subjectively, all the humans thought that smoking was a good thing because doctors told them it was good, um, it was popular, it felt good, you know? And people didn't really realize that smoking was bad. Now, objectively, now we know it's bad. But in the 1900s, like everyone just thought like smoking was a good thing and people did it for their health. There's actually like, you know, campaigns from doctors and stuff to demonstrate that smoking was actually good for your health. And so if you were a human in the 1900s, you may well have fallen prey to, you know, thinking smoking was good. But the problem is, is objectively for your health, Smoking is one of the worst things that you can do. And so if you were um, what we would call a critical person, right, someone that could think critically and analyze problems and you know, actually get to the bottom of things, you would not have done this. You, know, you would have fallen out of the subjective and into the objective. Now, every human being has their subjective opinion on something. But your job, basically, throughout life, if you want to become successful, and live a long, happy, like, well, I, I can't guarantee long, but if you want to live a good life from my perspective, what you're trying to do is take your subjective view on the world or on a certain thing 
and basically overlap it with the objective as much as humanly possible. Because the more, like, the more your sub subject is congruent with the actual object, the better your life is, okay? And a primary example of that is like the smoking thing. It's the easiest one I can give you. Like, you know, if you think smoking is good, but it's actually bad, but you do it, now you're gonna get to like 80 years old and then die of lung cancer, or maybe earlier, right? So how do you actually do this? Like, now that we understand that like lining up the subjective with the objective is one of the probably most important things in your life, how do we accomplish this? What methods of thought or critical thinking do we have to apply? Well, I kind of, the, I kind of just gave you the clue there. So what we need to learn to do is think critically, right? We need to learn how to think. Now, critical thinking is, is basically being able to think for yourself. And really, it's actually just being able to think full stop. And I can tell you now that honestly, I think I'm being generous here, probably only 1% of the human populace is actually capable of thinking critically, right? And there's no human being that is always capable of doing it. Because like, if, if, if there was one person that could think critically all the time, they would be like, you know, they'd, be, they'd, they'd run the world, basically. They'd own the world, right? So maybe there is someone, we just don't know about it, right? So we need to learn how to think critically. Um, and what critical thinking basically entails is being able to analyze problems um, and define problems and find solutions and basically see the world for what it actually is, right? Now, there's a quote, and I can't remember who came up with the quote, but basically the quote says that we don't see the world for what it is, we see the world for who we are, okay? And an example of this, if you're a, if you're a person, um, let's say that you know, you're a person in the 1400s, right? Now, if you are, you know, if this is you, Right, and you're, you're happy because you know, you've got your, your hat on, your farm, and well, I don't care, right? But you're in, let's just say this. And let's say that you live on, I don't know, a, a big farm, huge flatlands, right? And this is your farm, it goes on forever, you know, miles and kilometers of this. Now, it's kind of normal in the 1400s, if you're on your farm and it's just flat, that you're gonna say the earth is flat, right? Because you, you, we don't see the world for what it is, we see the world for who we are. And so if you're a farmer in the 1400s and you look out as far as the eye can see and your land just looks flat and you haven't got the ability to travel any further beyond that or look in the sky or do anything, of course you're gonna think the earth is flat, right? So the thing here is basically, and this is a bold statement, but I believe it to be true, basically, Everyone is wrong about everything all the time, constantly, right? Because we are limited to our perception. And so we can only see the truth as far as we can perceive the truth. And because the human experience is fundamentally constrained and limited by our senses, and we basically cannot get multiple perceptions on things, we don't see them in the right way. Okay, and we look at things and we think, okay, well, like, if you know, if you're this person, you can't tell me you wouldn't think the earth is flat, right? Or you wouldn't think the earth is round, whatever, right? You get the point. So nowadays, obviously, we can send satellites into space, we can conduct experiments, we can understand gravity, we can understand motion and stuff, and we can realize that the earth is round, right, objectively. But to someone who their only method of perception on the universe is this, they're kind of screwed. Another example of this, right, is, you know, when you look, when we look at ancient civilizations, right, you know, and that's just, they're all just leaning back a little bit here, and they look up in the sky, right, and this is, you know, this is the Pyramid of Giza or whatever, right, just pretend that's a pyramid, right, and they'd look up in the sky, and they would see stars in the sky, right, you know, and then also the sun would come up in the daytime, right, and these people, you know, this, this is like, you know, what, like, you know, let's just say 5,000, you know, BC, you know, they got no idea, right? So they're going to look up at the stars and they're going to look at the sun. And these people thought that the stars and the sun were gods, right? And that, you know, the sun was God and the stars were God because that's the only real explanation they could have. Human beings have an inbuilt 
um, you could almost call it a latent sort of understanding of theology where we want to look at God and see God and stuff like that. At least some people do, right? But they just thought that the stars were God. Now, we can look back at them from our lens of, you know, historical prowess in 2023, and we can be like, haha, you're all idiots, right? But this is the problem because, like, we can look at stars and know they're stars and look at the sun and know they're the sun, but if these people had access to the information we had access to, then they would believe the same thing we believe. But because their perception was fundamentally limited, they couldn't, right? And so, you know, back in the day, right, because in order for these people to survive, the sun needed to rise, right? And so what these people would do is they would build, you know, like the Aztecs and stuff, they'd build like, you know, um, like pyramids, and then they put people on these pyramids and then they just like sacrifice them. Because then they'd sacrifice someone every day to just to, to, because they knew that if they sacrificed one person a day, the sun would rise. And so they built a relationship between sacrifice and sunrise. And so this is what I mean by there's an objective reality and a subjective reality, right? And in this instance, the objective is, well, the sun is just the sun, it's gonna rise for the next couple billion years, no matter what. But the subjective is, okay, we need that thing to survive. And every time we seem to kill someone, it seems to rise. So let's just kill someone, right? And that obviously creates a lot of suffering. And so this is what I mean by, like, it's very common for humans, and for, I'm including myself in this, right? It's very common for us people to look at something and form a very strong opinion about how that thing is when we have an extremely limited perception of it. And this is an unbelievably dangerous way to think. And I do it, you do it, everyone does it. The leaders of the world do it, the leaders of the big military do it. Like we are extremely constrained and fundamentally limited. So the only real way to combat this is to think critically. And critical thinking is when you basically challenge the status quo and you don't accept the rules. You don't accept the premises or um, foundations that that civilization is built on, right? So I can give you an example of this, right? So if we take Charles Darwin, I'm gonna give you a few examples of critical thinking and then we'll actually get into how to think critically because there is a framework you can actually use that I use every day in my business um, to make tens of millions of dollars every year, okay? And no doubt this is gonna make me billions, right? But there's an actual framework and I'm gonna teach it to you, but for now, we're gonna stick with some examples because I think this point to draw home. So Darwin, um, if, you, if you haven't read, um, if you haven't read The Origin of Species, but I think it's The Origin of Species by Darwin, um, you should go and read it. It's a very good book, right? But Darwin, basically, um, he was like, I think this was, yeah, so he basically, um, in his time, everyone, um, you know, believed in God, right? And this is just supposed to be like church. So he came from the UK, good old lad, and everyone's Christian, and you know, everyone's about the church, right? And you know, that's that, right? And so basically the consensus or the popular opinion during Darwin's time was that all life on earth was created by God and it was a creationist society, essentially, right? And um, for years, thousands of years, not one single person questioned this premise, right? Maybe a couple of people did, but they didn't have the ability to prove it, right? And so for thousands of years, everyone went by just believing that all life on earth was created by God, right? Now, I'm not here to tell you what you should and shouldn't believe religiously, but I'm just telling you what happened in history. So Darwin comes along and Darwin gets in a boat, right? So this is the ocean here. And, um, you know, Darwin, he gets in this, this boat, you know, let's just pretend that's a boat for argument's sake. And he's on this boat, right? And here he is, you know, with his big, big, big brain. And he sails past these things called the Galapagos Islands, right? You know, blah, blah, blah. And what Darwin notices um, is that on different islands, there's different species of finch that have different beaks adapted to different food sources on different islands. And long story short, I won't bore you with the details, Darwin comes back to the UK um, and he comes up with the theory of natural selection, which states that all life, and there's obviously more to it than that, right? People think that Darwin's theory just stems from these finches, but it actually stems from like two decades of, um, of, of like naturalist theory, but anyway, story for another day. Um, but Darwin comes back, right? And he goes to the church, and this is a bold thing to do, right? He goes to the church and he's like, hang on a minute, boys, I'm not quite sure that the way you see the world is right. And then what happens is the church, they kind of get crazy, they get mad. Because when you challenge someone's opinion, 
um, they get angry and their ego rises up. And if you've ever wondered why someone's ego rises up when you challenge their opinion, it's because you're challenging the very like fragile nature of their entire perception of the world. And so what human beings do throughout life is we basically create these ideas and these beliefs, right? And these belief systems are basically a way for us to, well, let's just, let's just do this, right? So we create these belief systems, right? For example, like, you know, God created life, right? Now I'm not invalidating this statement. I'm not validating it. I'm just saying this is a potential belief statement people might have, right? And so if you've ever wondered why do people's egos get so riled up when you tell them they're wrong, and why do you get so angry when someone says you're wrong, is because what your ego is trying to do is defend you from pure chaos. Because if you have a belief system about the way the world works, and it transpires that that belief system is wrong, then suddenly, like, the very thing that is orienting, orienting you in the world is being stripped away, right? And so a belief system is kind of like, um, like life is like this, right? Where you're in an ocean, and this ocean is endlessly deep, right? And on your, you know, in the ocean is basically, let's just draw this. In the ocean is like a life raft, right? And you are sat in this life raft, right? And this thing is keeping you afloat, right? So this is chaos. And this here is order. And we form belief systems to basically like keep ourselves afloat from the chaos. So that even if our belief system is wrong, at least like we have something to float on and we're not delved into the chaos. And so when someone comes along, and this is basically your belief, right? And when someone comes along and they say, hey, your belief is wrong, what they're trying to do is like puncture your life raft, right? And if that happens, then obviously you're gonna, you know, what's gonna happen is, you know, this thing is gonna dissolve and you are gonna be sunk into pure chaos. And this is why our belief systems are so tied to our ego and why we hate to be wrong because to be wrong indicates that for some period of time we have to dive into the chaos of life and not know what how to orient ourselves or like what to pin ourselves against and it's just you float and human beings hate to do this right and so this is what happened with darwin is he challenged basically everyone and it, it wasn't really for for like a couple of hundred years before darwin's theory actually was accepted you know, it's the same thing with, um, with Galileo, I think it's Galileo. Um, Galileo basically did some observations. And at the time, right, we had the sun and then we had Earth, right? You know, this is, this is planets, we can draw Africa here, whatever. We had the sun and we had the Earth. And the time, like Galileo's time, um, in the early, what well, it must have been like 1200, 1300, I don't know. Anyway, the idea was that the sun rotated around the Earth. This is what we believe, typical human, um, you know, narcissism and ego. We believe the sun and all of the other planets, you know, over here, rotated around the earth and that we were the center. We basically, everyone believed, right? And this is humans for you. This is what happens when you give narcissism, narcissism power. Everyone believed that the earth was the center of the universe, right? And so basically like what happened is Galileo, like people, scientists would come along and like discover motion and like gravity and stuff. And then like, this was obviously Newton, but people would sort of look at this and be like, well, no, I can actually demonstrate with critical math and thinking that, you know, the, um, the sun and all the planets, like they don't rotate around the earth. We all rotate around the sun, right? Because what people on earth at that time thought, that like, all they'd look up in the sky and they would just see the earth like going around, you know, they'd see the sun come up and then the sun go down and then the moon come up and then all the planets would go around. And of course, you're going to think that everything revolves around the earth because you're on the earth and you see everything revolving around it. But it's not until someone questions it and takes a perspective. So be prepared. When you learn to think critically, um, when you learn to do this, and when you challenge people, they're going to give you, they're going to give you hell. You know, there were scientists in, in history who have actually been killed for speaking the truth. Um, you know, and this is also true with the Roman Empire and stuff and also every civilization throughout history. Um, the people in power tend to kill people that disagree with them because like, that's change and that's progression and typically progression is going to go away from the status quo which is what they're using to control the populace, right? And so you have to understand that people who think critically, they have a huge advantage because they allow themselves to line up their paradigm and have an, have an interlacement or an overlap 
between what they believe and what the world, how the world actually operates. So, you know, someone like Darwin, you know, good old Darwin, he can come along, um, come up with this theory and change the entire way that 8 billion people see the world. How amazing is that? Like, you know, up until Darwin, no, nobody, everyone just genuine. Imagine, imagine like your position right now in life without knowing natural selection. Now, of course, you might not give it too much credence, but I don't think you understand just how, how impactful this theory has been, the, the theory of natural selection. Same thing with Watson and Crick and the double helix, right? Same thing with um, Da Vinci. In Da Vinci's time, everyone thought that the brain was basically a blood cooling device and that, brain, um, and that blood would flow to your brain, your brain would cool it down, and then again. Another example I can give you is the theory of miasma. Right? If you study the history of disease, miasma was basically the belief that, and this was, this was a widely held belief during the time, of the, the time of the bubonic plague, was that the plague was spread through bad smell. Right? And that was basically how the plague was spreading. Now, we, we have the lens of history now where we can look back and you know, we can say it was the rats and like the fleas and the rats and stuff. But for, for years, everyone tried to protect themselves by not smelling bad things but they wouldn't care too much about the rats or the lice or the people or being infected. It was just, if you stay away from the smell, you won't get the plague. And this is an example where there's an objective reality where it's the rats, right? And there's a subjective reality where it's the smell. And if you're in this one, you're gonna die. But if you're in this one, you're probably gonna be fine. And so it can actually come down to life or death. But that's enough examples. I think let's actually get into how to actually critically think and you know actually analyze something here okay so i've got some notes because this is quite a big topic and for me to break it down i'm gonna have to like refer to some stuff here um but yeah let's basically get into it so really it, the way most people think right because what we want to start by doing is identifying kind of the the wrong way most people don't have any barrier or critical thinking ability um not because like they aren't able to do it but basically just because it's kind of how we are born and we are conditioned by, by society, by our family, by teachers, by peers, etc., to not have this built in. Because the truth is, is that critical thinking requires a lot of energy. And it's, it's, a very, um, it's a very inefficient thing for the brain to do, to actually think. And the brain loves efficiency, so it kind of creates this problem. But most normal people, right, this is how they work, right? So normal people, when, like, when they're receiving information, the information is basically filtered, right? So let's just say this here, all of this stuff is information, right? Information in the environment coming through the five senses, right? And basically, most normal people, they will filter information typically through uh, like three things, right? So they'll filter it through the source. Um, they'll filter it through, um, eh, what, what else do you think there is? They'll, they'll filter it through um, like peers and then they'll filter it through belief, right? So when like life is about basically being able to assimilate information in the most accurate manner possible, the better you become at assimilating information and what I mean by assimilate is being able to receive it, judge it, understand it and decide on it. You know, because really all there is is information. So your ability to deal with this thing is, is everything, right? So the first thing that people filter their information through as to whether or not they believe it is true is what is the source, right? So an example, um, and this is, this is where it all falls apart, right? This is where it becomes very easy for it to be wrong. Um, if a doctor says it, it must be true. If the, new, if the BBC says it, it must be true. If Trump says it, it must be true. If Hillary says it, it must be true. If, you know, it, like people, the first thing they use to filter information, to determine whether or not it resembles the truth and the objective nature of the world is where the information came from, right? Now, this is kind of like, you know, I'm gonna give you some other examples later on in the video, um, but this is the first thing that people really get wrong. They, they give too much credit to authority. They give too much credit to news. They give too much credit to certain people. Um, and the truth is that the source of the information is usually doesn't have too much of like 
It doesn't really, the, 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 people give, okay, so it's asymmetric credit. What I'm saying is people give way too much credit to the source of the information when the source of the information has very little impact on the quality of the information. And so that's the first thing. The second thing people will filter information through is peers, right? And this basically, they'll ask the question of, do a lot of other people believe this to be true? Okay. And the last one is their belief system. So does this fit into my preconceived notion of the world? And can, like, do, should I, they, people will either, you know, reject or receive information and assimilate information based on what they believe to be true about the world. And so this is what, like, this is what information is filtered through, right? And so, you know, for example, how, like, if you're in nature or you're trying to survive, like, you can filter water through different things, right? So if you build, like, a natural water filter, you might put, like, logs up here, and then you'll put like, you know, pebbles in here and then you'll put like refined charcoal in here and then you'll pour water in and the water will be filtered through and hopefully at the end you get nice, clean drinking water, right? This is not how this works, right? Because the source is usually wrong, um, the peers are usually wrong and the belief system is usually wrong. The learning to challenge your belief systems is one of the diff most difficult things to do as a human being. Um, like, I'd actually encourage you to do an exercise right now, and this is going to rub your ego up the wrong way, but you're going to do it anyway, I think, big idea. Um, take any belief system you have right now, right? Any belief system in any way, shape, at all, any belief system. Just pick one and, and write it down, right? And, like, just pick one, right? Write it down, any belief system. For example, um, I believe that one niche is the right thing to do, or I believe that... Um, the earth is round, like any belief system you have at all, right? Now, what you then need to do is start to challenge the belief and pull it apart and ask yourself why you believe it. But we'll get into this because this is a critical thinking, right? But we need to start thinking in this way. So most people just bring their information and they process it through the source, the peers, and, and whether or not they, they reject it or basically intake it into their life is dependent on these three things. The problem with this is that authority is the most dangerous way to judge information. Most people are wrong about everything all the time, and your belief systems very rarely line up with the objective nature of reality, okay? So this is kind of like the least objective triad in the world, right? But people who are smart and people who can think critically, these people do it differently. Right, so these people, if you've got the same information, right, you've got this triangle, they will filter the information in a different way, right? So they start with why. Well, actually, no, they don't start with why. That's not true. Mm -hmm. So these people will analyze um, the challenge, um, and then they'll ask why. And then basically what these people do, people who can think critically, like they won't use, they won't filter information through themselves, through other people or through authority. They'll filter the information through questioning, essentially. Um, and they'll filter it through the objective process, Socratic reasoning, first principles reasoning. And this way makes a lot more sense, right? So let's get into actually how to do this. Um, and let's begin, all right. So essentially, you want to operate on the premise that everything is wrong until proven right. And this is the same thing with everyone. Everyone slash everything is wrong until proven right. Okay? Because I like you only have to look at history to realize that this is true. People are wrong about everything all the time. I'm wrong about stuff all the time. You're wrong about stuff all the time. Throughout history, like, we're sort of, you know, if this is the objective nature of the world, you know, we start, like, way back here, and every every hundred years, we get closer and closer to the truth. And really, like, the, the, the thing is, is right now, we probably don't have an objective view of the world. There are, like, we are blind in so many ways. There are so many theories understandings and paradigms that we currently lack or are missing that are preventing us from actually seeing the world for what it truly is, right? We don't know really anything. We think we know the truth, but the truth moves. The truth and the facts move as we 
build and develop different perceptions on different things, right? And I won't, I'm not gonna be surprised if in my lifetime there's some scientific breakthrough or some mental breakthrough that completely changes the way we see things. Um, an example of this is with psychology, right? Um, Carl Jung came along and basically discovered the unconscious. And we did not even know there was an unconscious until Carl Jung discovered it. So, like, and that only happened a couple of hundred years ago. So, like, God knows what we're gonna discover, you know, about ourselves or about nature or about, you know, the world. So, basically, you want to believe that everyone's wrong until proven right. All information, all belief systems, like, obviously you can't do this with everything because it's gonna be chaos, but things that matter, everything's wrong until proven right, okay? So, what does this, what do you need to watch out for? Well, the main thing that is gonna be wrong is authority. Um, the news and social media. Now, this really is where most people source their information from. And in psychology, we have something called the authority misweighing tendency. And the authority misweighing tendency basically states that we give more credence or more credibility to the ideas, beliefs, or you know, propositions from individuals who we perceive to have authority. And because of that, we misweigh the validity of the idea and that creates all sorts of problems where like a lot of people are wrong about stuff all the time. Um, for example, a friend of mine um, went to a doctor recently because he was feeling quite down, right? Um, he had this ingling that he had depression. Um, and like, so he went to a doctor and the doctor sat down with him for about five minutes and asked him a couple of questions. And within five minutes, the doctor prescribed this guy antidepressants, right? Pretty life-changing drug. And he, he came to me about it and he said, well, what do you think? And I said, well, like, let's analyze, you know, the thing. Like, really, can someone actually be diagnosed with depression in five minutes? Like, is this actually, like, sure, they're a doctor and they've been through seven, eight years of training and they may know significantly more than me about, you know, the medical world, but why don't we try and explore other solutions before, like, we get into it? So we went through the critical thinking process um, hooked him up with a different diet, corrected his sleep, and now he feels fine, right? And this is an example of like, most people would just take the pills because an authority figure said so. And the same thing is true with the news. Sorry, I've just got a call coming in, okay? The same thing is true with the news, right? Where um, I can give you an example of this, where um, a couple of years ago, when the UK left the EU, we had Brexit, right? And with Brexit, there was a Leave party and there was a Remain party. And the Leave Party basically said that every week we spend 350 million pounds on the EU and that if we left the EU, we could give that money to the NHS. This was a lie, right? There was no evidence of this in any way, shape or form. The 350 million pounds a week didn't exist. It didn't, there was, it was a complete lie. And this was plastered all over the news and all over social media. And reputable news sources and reputable, reputable, right, social media sources, everyone was talking about this. And they said, well, if we leave the EU, we can give that money to the NHS. And it was just a complete lie. There was no, like, no one actually, like, thought for a second, hang on, this is probably BS. Although a lot of people did. But the people who um, were filtering the information, you know, through the triad, their belief system, you know, already stated that the EU was bad. And so this information... It's actually 350 million pounds. And they're, they're basically, their belief system is that the EU is bad or that the NHS is underfunded. And so because this idea fitted with their belief system, they believed it to be true. And this is what you have to watch out for as a human. If a piece of information corresponds or already interlines with one of your belief systems, you're going to give it more credibility and more credence, right? And so you need to watch out for that. All right. Okay, so how do you actually do this? Like, how do we actually think critically? Because, you know, you're going to be given a piece of information like this, and your job is to basically untangle it, see it for what it is, and decide whether or not you want to integrate it into your life. So let's actually get into how to think critically here, okay? So uh, if I come up here, this is good, right? Yeah, step one, remove yourself. Okay, step two. Mm -hmm. Well, no. Define objects. Step three. 
to define relationships. And I have my mentor, Sam, by the way, to thank for this model. I can't take credit for it. Um, define relationships, define timeline. Okay. Um, and then we can start, probably start there. Yeah. Remove emotions and remove loops, okay? So the first thing that we're trying to do here um, is follow a six step process to think critically, okay? So when we receive um, a big ball of information, you know, if you're trying to you know, solve a problem or make a decision, um, for example, what diet should you eat? Should we leave the EU? Oh, this client's ads campaign not working. Why is it not working, right? You can apply this to basically anything, right? And so step number one is to remove yourself, right? It's extremely difficult to be objective when you are in a subjective stance, right? And so the first thing you have to learn to do um, when you're trying to solve a problem is remove yourself from the problem and try your best to see the problem from a third person perspective because for as long as, the, for as, long as you are inside of the problem seeing it as yourself, you're gonna be in some trouble. This is why it's so much easier to give advice to someone when you are like giving the advice. Because if you have a problem and your friend has a problem, it's very likely that you can solve that problem for them and give way better advice to them than you could to yourself. And that's because you're not involved. Because when, when you haven't removed yourself, when you're involved in the problem, what basically happens is all of your biases interfere with your ability to actually see objectively, right? And so if this is the objective reality here, right, and this is you, the way this works is there's a sort of a sheet, you know, between you and the objective world. And this sheet is basically all of your biases, right? And so you will always see the world through your biases. And so, for example, if objectively, right, if this, if, if reality itself is green, right, and just, this is an abstraction, right, but if reality itself is green, but you, ha you have a black bias, and there's no racial intention there, of course, don't be an idiot, right? If, you ha if, your, if your bias is black, right, but reality is green, then what's going to happen is you're going to see reality through the lens of blackness. And so to you, reality will manifest itself as black when it's actually green. And so all of your behaviors and all of your life is going to be built around the idea that the like reality is black when like objectively it's actually green. And so you're out of alignment with the true nature of the world, which means all your decisions, all your actions, all your capabilities are manifesting in the wrong direction and are gonna create some suffering, right? So the first thing to do is to remove yourself. Now, the next thing to do is basically to define objects, right? And so if, if we actually talk about becoming, you know, objective, right? in one sense of the word, this means being able to actually see past labels, see past naming conventions, and identify objects, right? So for example, um, if I was going to like build a system, what you need to be able to do is comprehend the objects of what that entails, right? So I can give you an example. So for example, I can probably just draw it down here. So what is a system, right? Well, that's a huge question. So how do we critically think through that problem? Like what is a system? Well, what you do is you try to define the components of the, of the argument or the components of the thing you're dealing with, right? So, well, what does the system need to run? Well, you know, the system needs to have an input, right? The system needs to have an output at its core form because like, well, a system is basically gonna take something and turn it into something else. So we need something to put in and something coming out. Without that, a system cannot exist. So immediately we've defined two objects inside of this problem, right? And then, well, how do we go from input to output? Well, we need to have a process, right? So that's another component of a system. This is an object. We're making objects out of abstractions, right? Um, and then like for a system to really work, it needs to have feedback. That's not obvious to a lot of people. If you haven't read Thinking in Systems by Donella Meadows, you won't know that. Um, but then we have feedback, right? But the system itself, isn't actually going to exist like on its own because any system is going to exist inside of an environment, right? For example, if, if you take, um, 
if you take the cardiovascular system, right? Um, the cardiovascular system is essentially taking oxygen and turning it into car carbon dioxide, right? Or the respiratory system is an easier example of this. Respiratory system is like taking in you know, air, taking in the oxygen and expelling carbon dioxide, right? And it's using the lungs, the process, you know, and, and the, um, God for my biology days, I can't remember, but it's using the surface area of your lungs and the like parts of your lungs to convert this, you know, these chemicals so that you can live basically. And, you know, every time there's feedback. So, you know, the, the body will tell you how much oxygen it has. For example, if you hold your breath, you're gonna get this urge to like breathe because, well, the body's giving you feedback and you haven't got enough oxygen, right? But the other thing is the body operates in an environment because if you smoke um, or if you vape or if you exercise, your lungs are gonna be more capable of converting oxygen into carbon dioxide. If you don't exercise or not. So there's other things that influence the, the respiratory system. And so what we can also define is an environment, right? So this is basically the first step in critical thinking. If you have a problem to solve or something you need to understand or a decision to make, you want to start by identifying the objects. And what you're going to have observed is I've done this countless, probably a dozen times already in this video, right? Where like if I'm trying to explain to you um, Galileo's theory of, um, of the, everything not you know, revolving around the earth, what I'm doing is I'm defining the objects, right? And it might seem obvious, but being able to visualize them and define the objects allows you to better understand, convey your argument and get super clear on what you're doing, right? And so, you know, I've, I've, you can, I've, I've done, you can go back to the video and rewatch it. And whenever I draw something, if I'm trying to explain something to you, I am basically like the object. For example, when I explain like, you know, if, if I want to explain why people hold on to their belief systems, I'm like, okay, well, you know, we've got chaos, right? And then we've got like a life raft, which is the belief system, right? And then we've got you inside of the life raft, you know, chilling. Well, oh, that is not, that is not an appendage. Um, you know, we've got you inside of the life raft and, you know, so now I'm creating objects like belief system is life raft, chaos, is like under the ocean and you know, you're in here. So this is like what I'm trying to do to convey points because if you want to learn to think critically, you, you start with objects because it makes everything much easier to understand, right? So let's continue. So that's basically how do you become, well, you have to objectify things. To become objective, you have to start by actually objectifying things. And it gets a lot easier to talk in these terms than it does in terms of abstractions and you want to use diagrams at every step of the way to you know, solidify your understanding of what you're actually dealing with. The next thing is to define relationships, right? And so I'll give you another example of this, right? Let's say, um, let's say that, um, let's say that I am in a social circle with a group of like four people and they're all talking behind each other's backs and I need to figure out how to like fix the relationship so the friendship group can be you know more coherent and so that nobody's going to be upset. Like what I would do is I'd be like, okay, instead of talking in like abstract terms, I'd actually con make it concrete. So you know, if I've got like if I've got a social circle, right, and you know things are not going well, but I want it to go well, what I do is I'd start by you know mapping out the people, you know, so you know like this, and then this person here. Right? And so instead of seeing them as my friends, I'd see them as person one, two, three, and four, which is kind of a psychopathic, sociopathic way to think, but it gets easier when you remove names and you actually just you know put numbers in. Um, and so let's say that you know person number one likes person number four, but person number four doesn't like the person number three, which is why person number one doesn't like person number three. Person number two is friends with person number four and three, but doesn't like person number one, and because of this, person number three does not like person number four, right? So this is an example. Explaining that without a diagram is impossible. But what I've done here is the third step in critical thinking where I've defined the relationships between the objects, right? So what we can see here now is what the problem actually is, right? The problem really is that person number three doesn't like person number four. So person number four doesn't like person number three. So really the, the feud is simply just between these people. Although person number two doesn't like person number one. So you want to start by understanding the problem. We're not, at this point, we're not trying to solve, we're just trying to understand. And the solution usually comes just by understanding it, right? And then once we've done this, there's all sorts of other stuff we can do, which I'll explain in a second, right? So 
you need to you need to identify the relationships between the components or the objects to understand it. So another example here, if we take the system. So right here we have the building blocks of a basic you know um, a process of a system. Right, we have inputs and outputs, processes, feedback, and environment. Right, and so what we now need to do is understand the relationship between these things. Right, and we need to understand how they are interlinked and how they relate to each other so that we can build a proper understanding of the objective nature of this thing, right? And so what we're essentially going to do is we're going to take the components and we're going to put them into like a, a state of relationship, right? So here we have the input because, you know, we're going to start with the input because the input's the first thing. And then we have the process because the input needs to be processed. And then we have the output Right, so you can see that there. And then from the output, obviously we have feedback. Okay, and then the input, it feeds back into the input. And then over here, we have the environment because no system operates in a silo without an environment, right? So I'm just gonna bring this over here a little bit. There we go, okay. So what I've done is I've, I've basically identified the relationship between the variables. So the input is processed into an output, and when an output is processed by the process, what happens is feedback is given, right, to go back to the input. So, for example, um, input could be like air from the atmosphere into your lungs. The process can be like your lungs basically processing and like bringing, like you, you've got like a membrane which brings in oxygen and expels carbon dioxide, right? So the output is going to be CO2 and like other like waste gases. And then the feedback is going to be like, how well are these lungs working? Are we, do we need to speed up the, because when you, like in biology, there's something called your respiratory rate, or you've got like VO2 max and all these other sort of like things that your body intuitively understands to measure when it's breathing to know if you should be breathing more or not. For example, um, if, like if, if you've just gone for a run or you've just sprinted for like two seconds, or let's say you sprinted for 30 seconds, your body is going to give you feedback that you need more oxygen. And so well, every time your body processes the input into the output, the output is like, well, shit, we need more because we've just been for a run. And so the input is amplified, right? And then if we're not careful and we don't like regulate this, if we go, if we breathe like we always just sprinted all the time, we hyperventilate and die of probably of like oxygen poisoning, right? And so what happens is after a while, the blood, blood oxygen levels sort of steady and then the heart slows down and then the lungs process oxygen slower and we breathe slower. And that's basically like the relation. This is why this feedback thing exists. Any system cannot exist without feedback. And then on top of this, we have the environment, right? So like, are you, you know, are you smoking? Are you vaping? You know, are you doing stupid things that you shouldn't do? Or are you taking care of your lungs, right? And so this is like now what we've done is we actually understand what the thing is. So this is a lesson in systems thinking as well as critical thinking, but this is sort of an easy example just to give you, I could, I could go on forever, but you know, same thing with Charles Darwin and the Finches and all this stuff. But So step one, remove yourself, because now we've drawn this, or when I was drawing the friendship social circle and the relationships between them, I'm not involved, right? I'm just seeing this like as a third person, right? Um, then we've defined the objects. So what are we actually dealing with? What are the components of this piece of information or this argument, right? Um, and now we've defined the relationships. Right, so, you know, it's like, what are like the relationships between these things? Now, the fourth step is to define the time frame, Because now what we need to do is we need to organize our understanding of the thing we're dealing with against time. Because time brings order to chaos and it allows us to basically like better gauge and understand exactly what the hell is going on, right? So for example, um, uh, I, I, I'll give you a historical example here, like another example of like a, trying to analyze a piece of information, right? So let's say um, you wanted to um, understand um, like why um, the West is becoming, right? Why is the West becoming woke? Why are we leaning like towards left-wing politics? Why is all of this happening? I'm not saying this is good or bad, I'm just saying that this is what's happening, right? So maybe the thing you're trying to critically think through and understand is why is the West becoming woke? Okay, so first thing you find out. Well, let's just say, let's just make this a little bit clearer and just say the USA, right? And obviously not all of the USA is becoming woke, but a lot of it is, right? So well, what we're gonna do 
is obviously we need to start by you know actually identifying like the objects in the in this in the circumstance and what's going on and the relationships between all these things so you know we're going to look at like key people and then eventually what you're going to have to do is you're going to have to timeline all of your information so the first thing we're going to have to do here right is you obviously you know now we've got woke and then before we had not woke because i can tell you for free that you know when america was founded it was anything but woke right and so you know, what we're going to do is we're going to look at like what has happened. So obviously we're going to start with the colonization of America, right? Um, from, you know, Britain with the British Empire. We kind of came over and just were like, oh yeah, we like the look of this, thanks. And that's what we did for about 400 years, um, which is not to be um, tussled with right now. Um, so we start with the colonization of America, right? And then after a couple of hundred years, people in America are kind of like, do you know what? Like... Britain, like, I don't see you as, like, dad anymore, I'm a grown man, like, I'm a grown boy, I don't really want you to have this overbearing power of me, so we're going to have a civil war to basically have our independence. So then we have American independence, right? Now, my knowledge of history, American history beyond this point, gets extremely um, weak, unfortunately. I've studied the British Empire and I've studied the American Revolution, but anything north of this, I do not understand, so I can't really tell you. But the point here is what you want to do is you want to timeline all of the events that have happened leading up to things being woke, right? And so, like, an another example of this, um, maybe... <laughs> Maybe you want to understand why Swedish women are so beautiful, right? Because Sweden, like, Sweden is renowned for having beautiful women. It's like ranked by some subjective news articles on like having the most beautiful women. And you might want to be like, well, why? Right? And then, you know, you're going to analyze it and understand. And um, the argument is that basically, you know, all these hundred years ago, you have the Vikings in Sweden. And what would happen is the Vikings would go to other countries and like, you know, pillage and all this nasty stuff. And then the Vikings would bring the most beautiful women, you know, back home with them. And then obviously, like, that's why Swedish women are beautiful is because Vikings got their pick of the bunch because they were pillaging and being nasty. And the beautiful women they would bring home and reproduce with them. And now we have, like, it's why Scandinavian women are just so gorgeous, right? Because of the way that, like, these people would only pick the beautiful women to mate with. And that's kind of how it works. Now, I'm, I'm digressing here. But you get the point, right? You need, to, you need to define the timeline. So if once again, I've got friend one, friend two, you know, um, friend three, and friend four, right? And we remember that friend three doesn't like friend four, friend four doesn't like friend three, friend one doesn't like friend whatever, you know, they like this person, but this person likes this person, and they like him. You know, what we need to do is now we've identified the objects and the relationships, we need to identify the timeline at which these things happened. And so maybe it happened that, you know, in 2019, um, friend three, accidentally crashed friend one's car and promised to pay friend one back but never did right and so we we start with the timeline there right and that was that was that happened and then you know at this point friend one that wanted to get revenge so then they spilled water on i don't know right but the point here is you need to identify the timeline and so for example with the systems example um we start with here and then we come here and then here and then here. So we've already identified the timeline between these objects and the way that the information flows because, you know, we put the arrows in place, right? So the next thing to do, number five, is to remove emotions from the equation, right? So, for example, um, going back to the example of why are Scandinavian women so beautiful, right? Um, let's say that you have a thing against pretty girls and you don't like them for whatever reason, whatever's wrong with you or whatever, you know, I don't care, right? But let's say that you're trying to analyze that and understand it. Or let's say you're trying to analyze why America is so woke and trying to understand that, right? Well, when it comes to dealing with political stuff or anything that you might deem, you know, bad, right, you're going to have emotions about it. And so if you're trying to analyze something and be critical about something when you don't like woke people or you love woke people or you don't like pretty girls or you love pretty girls, you're going to filter your arguments and your decisions and your criticality through the lens of the emotion, right? And so this is a very difficult thing to do, but it is possible. It truly is possible to remove your emotion. Now, it's not just about removing it, it's about recognizing it. And so if you're trying to analyze the thing of why is America so woke, right? But let's just say that, you know, you're super right wing and you hate woke people. You just, you know, you can't stand them, right? For whatever reason, you just, you know, you don't like them. This is a skull to represent that you don't like them, right? See what I'm doing here? This is, I'm objective, 
This is, I'm objectifying. But anyway, let's say that you hate woke people, right? I'm not saying I do, I'm not saying you should, I'm just saying that let's say someone does. If you're trying to analyze why America is woke, what you're more likely to do is just, instead of looking at the historical timeline and the cause and effect relationships that have resulted in this cultural phenomenon developing, what you're gonna do is you're just gonna blame the people who are woke and just say, oh, they're just weak and they're this, that, and the other, or you know, they just don't understand the way the world works, they never worked there in their life. And what's gonna happen is all of your thinking is gonna be filtered through your hatred. This is called the disliking hating tendency um, in psychology. On the flip side, you have the liking loving tendency in psychology, it's these are cognitive biases that are um, studied and recognized. But, the point here is it's kind of impossible to be objective when your emotions are at play. And so what you can do is you can recognize if an emotion exists, and when you recognize an emotion exists, just park it. Be like, okay, I can feel this emotion, I can feel anger, I can feel the sadness, I can feel the anxiety, whatever it might be, and just recognize it and just sit with it. And don't try to remove it. Well, you wanna try and remove it, but it's kind of the first step to removal is recognition. And then, Try and park it, calm yourself down, and then continue with the analysis, right? It's entirely possible to do it, it just takes practice, okay? Now, the next thing to do is the sixth point, which is to remove loops, okay? So, so this, is more, this is more of a question of if you're dealing with someone who has like a problem they're trying to solve, or if someone's explaining a piece of information to you, human beings tend to be extremely terrible at explaining things um, in objective terms, in critical terms. And what they'll do is they'll constantly loop things back in their arguments, right? So for example, if I'm doing a coaching call for someone um, and I'm teaching a client how to get clients, um, and they come to me and they're like, I can't get clients. And they'll say the same thing like, you know, 10 times. And so often what happens if you're not careful when you're analyzing arguments is people will repeat the same thing or the same piece of information over and over again. And there's this thing in psychology, once again, called the availability cascade. And what it means is that if a piece of information is more readily available to the, the, the mind, we're more likely to give it credibility and credence. And so when you're analyzing information and when you're analyzing an argument or you know, trying to formulate you know, an understanding of something and be critical, um, it's imperative that you remove the loops associated with it. Because just because something is repeated over and over again doesn't mean it's actually more important. Okay, primary example of this, coming back to the Brexit thing, you know, the lack of critical thinking that made us leave the EU was a 350 million pounds. And then it was also Turkey. They were like, Turkey's gonna join and you know, it's gonna cost us 350 million pounds per week. You know, this is an incomprehensible amount of money to the average person in the UK. And for some reason, a lot of people in the UK didn't like the idea of Turkey joining. The Leave Party knew this. And what they did is they just looped it. They repeated the same piece of information over and over and over and over again. Once again, cognitive bias in psychology called the familiarity tendency, um, the, the tendency for us to give credence to things that are more familiar, and it links in with the availability cascade. And this is dangerous because if this is just looped over and over, if a human being is sat down you know, in their office or in their study, trying to make an educated vote on should we leave the EU or should we stay in the EU, and this is the same thing for other political parties as well, um, Trump did this as well, right? I can give you an example in, with American presidency recently. Trump did this where um, he said, we're gonna build a wall, right? We're gonna build a wall between like Texas and Mexico, right? So we can, for the immigration and all that stuff. Once again, not saying it's right or wrong, just saying, you know, it is this. And he was like, we're gonna build a wall. And what did he do? He repeated this thing and looped it over and over and over again, right? So when the average American voter sat down to vote for either like, Trump or Hillary or whoever it was at the time, um, this piece of information would be looped so much that they gave more credibility to it and they thought it must be a good idea because it's everyone saying it, right? So that's basically the six step process to like analyzing the information, right? Because before we can actually solve a problem or like before we can really do anything with the information or make a decision, we need to understand objectively exactly what we're dealing with. And so this is basically here, like really, if you think about it, um, critical thinking, it kind of falls into two states, right? Um, you can see that, not really. I don't want to rub this off yet, you can see here. So thinking critically, right? There's basically two stages, and I've just described the first stage, right? Stage one is building your understanding. And then stage two, is probably, well, once again, it's still, it's still understanding. There's a quote from, I think it was Einstein or Newton, that said, if I had an hour to solve a problem, I'd spend the first like 
55 minutes understanding it. But basically, we want to start by understanding it and then solving it, right? So this is basically, this is basically becoming objective. It's analyzing the information and getting to grips with the thing you're actually dealing with so that when you come to make a decision or prescribe a solution or solve a problem, you know that what you're dealing with is true and you're being objective. This is about getting the facts. It's about getting to the truth, right? So we start with removal of the self, then we define the objects, then we define the relationships between the objects and the timelines by which those relationships are built on. And then um, we remove our emotions and then we remove the loops and then we know we're actually dealing with something and we're dealing with objective reality, right? So once we've done this, right, and once we've actually assimilated the information properly and understood it, it's time to go one step deeper, right? So I'm gonna pause the video and come back. All right, I'm back. Took a quick break because this was going on for a long time. But I wanted to actually grab my laptop here to give you an example of um, what I mean by relationships and objects, just to drill this point home and really show what it means. So what you can see on the screen here, I don't know if you can see this, but this is my team. So I run a eight figure consulting business called Imperium Acquisition, and we have about 14, well, about 20 people on our team, like 14 core team members, 30 indirect team members. So it rounds up. And what this looks like is like this. So you can see here, I've listed out the objects, right? In terms of the team members. And then I have basically presented the relationships between all of them. Because like I, things were kind of getting out of hand with the company. I was like, what the hell have I built? And so I wanted to understand it. So that's just an example, um, like just a, an example I want to give you. So now it's time for us to actually explore how to like, how to know whether or not something's true, right? Because, you know, I've taught you how to process information and understand things, right? But now it's time to actually put some rubber to the road, so to speak, and understand like, if someone says something, how do you know whether or not it's true, right? So basically what's gonna happen is people are going to make arguments, right? Now I don't mean argument is in like, you know, anger or hate-filled speech that, you know, breaks down communication. What I mean is an argument is like a statement of truth that a human being is gonna present to you. Um, and I'm gonna give you some examples and we're gonna get into it. So when it comes to an argument, what we need to be able to do is we need to be able to examine arguments, right, in a critical way. Because if someone says to you something that is not true and you believe it, now suddenly your life is no longer in alignment with the objective nature of the world, which means that your decisions and actions are out of alignment with reality, which means you're going to suffer. And so if you don't want to suffer, you need to learn to analyze arguments. This takes a lot of effort, a lot of time, um, but it's possible, okay? So first thing is what we're gonna do is we're gonna use the model that I just explained to understand this, because I've just given you a piece of information that in order to be successful, you have to examine arguments, right? So what we need to now do is break down and assimilate this information. So we're gonna start by identifying the object of an argument, right? So you see how this works. I'm gonna give you a live example, right? So basically an argument is really broken up into three things, right? So just on my paper here, um, the first thing, well, basically it works like this. Claim. Premise. Conclusion, right? So what I've done here is I've taken information, I've assimilated it, and now we have three objects, right? And so basically when it comes to an argument, a claim is basically a statement of truth. A premise is something that backs up that statement and the conclusion basically just repeats the claim, right? And so like, this is how it works. So um, for example, um, I could just say, um, Cold email doesn't work. Doesn't work because I didn't get, let's just do this. Sorry. Right, so this is an example of an argument. 
Cold email doesn't work, and that basically means cold email doesn't help people get clients. Cold email doesn't work because I didn't get results, so YouTube is better. So what we have here is the claim, which is cold email doesn't work. Then we have the premise, which is because I didn't get results. And then we have the conclusion, which is so YouTube is better. So really, like, a conclusion is also a claim, but what they're trying to do here is make the point, like the real argument of this argument is that YouTube is better than cold email. And so kind of the, the claim can become the premise for the conclusion, but also the conclusion can become a claim, right? Does that make sense? So this is an example of an argument. Another example of an argument could be, um, you know, if we just take, you know, the miasma theory, right, that I talked about earlier, where people believed that, you know, the bubonic plague and diseases were spread through smell, right? It could be um, smell spreads disease because um, I smelled a bad smell and got sick. So, oh, so there is no need to wash, wash your hands. Believe it or not, before, like during the act, during my asthma, during that theory, um, doctors did not wash their hands. They perform open surgery without washing their hands, which is crazy to us now. But at the time, it seemed like the right thing to do. So here we have, um, here we have the claim. Smell spreads disease. And then here we have the premise, which is because I smelled it and got sick. And then here we have the conclusion. So what you need to be able to do is like define arguments into their three components, which is basically um, claim, premise and conclusion. And then break it down and, and ask ourselves, well, does this resemble the truth? Is this person seeing reality objectively? Are they aligned with the truth? How do I know it's true, right? So let's actually walk through how to, how to sort of examine an argument. This is the most probably, like, probably is the most important thing that a human being can ever be taught to do ever. But for some reason, the school system doesn't even like clip it. It doesn't even it doesn't even touch base with it. Mainly because nobody knows how to do this, right? But that's kind of the point. So, how do we? I'm gonna put this up here. How do we examine an argument? Well, okay. So the first thing is judge from all angles. Um, the second thing is um, buh, 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 examine motive. And the third thing is going to be, um, well, I suppose the motive kind of is the third thing. Um, okay, facts versus opinions. So when it comes to analysing an argument and understanding whether or not someone is telling the truth. Here's the thing, this is what people don't get, right, about, before we get into this, is there's a very big difference between telling the truth and being wrong. So if someone, if someone says, like, cold email doesn't work because it didn't work for me, so it doesn't work, or if someone says that I don't wash my hands because smell is how disease is spread, or if someone says I sacrifice a child every day so the sun rises tomorrow, they are telling the truth. This is the thing you have to understand, is they, just because someone's wrong doesn't mean they don't think they're telling the truth. There is a very big difference between being wrong and lying. Lying is when you utter words that are out of alignment with what you believe the nature of the world is. But being wrong just means that you're not seeing the world properly. And so you have to remember this, like just because someone is wrong doesn't mean they're lying. Because if you, like, if people are wrong about stuff all the time, I'm, I'm wrong about stuff all the time, everyone is like, it's, it's very common, right? But if I came to you and, um, and said the earth is flat because I'm a 1400s peasant farmer that can only just see the earth and it's definitely flat, I'm gonna come to you and be like, the earth is flat. And I will have conviction in my tone because of the way my ego is gonna back up my belief, right? And I'll be like, the earth is flat, the earth is flat, the earth is flat, because on my farm, if I stand there and I look, I, for as far as the eye can see, all I see is flat, so the earth is definitely flat, right? Now, I am wrong but I am telling the truth. So when it comes to examining people's arguments, 
you have to remember that just because you might think they're wrong doesn't mean they don't think they're telling the truth, right? So that's kind of how it works. So the first step here is to basically judge the argument from all angles, right? So what's going to happen when someone has an argument is if you disagree with them, you're going to have your opinion and they're going to have their opinion. And you guys are going to see things in a very different way, right? So for example, this comes back to, let me get some other pens here. So let me explain this, right? So let's say, um, we're going to use an abstraction here. So let's say that right here um, is, you know, let's just draw this a second here. Okay, um, right here we have an easel, right? And on the easel, you know, we have this big sheet of paper, right? Do, 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 okay? And on the sheet of paper, um, let's just say is a drawing of, um, let's just say a smiley face, right? You have a smiley face, and this is, you know, an artist has drawn this. Now, here's the thing, right? We've now got people. Right? Let us redraw them closer. Okay, so let's say that we've got this person here, this person here, and this person here, right? So now let's then argue, okay, that this person here has blue glasses on, right? This person here has red glasses on, and this person here has green glasses on, okay? So we've got a blue drawing, right? But we've got people with different shades of, like, with different, well, let's just say the drawing is blue, right? But these people have different colored glasses on, different tints of glasses, right? And so what's gonna happen is reality is going to manifest differently to each person. And so the first step to examining an argument is to try and judge the argument from all angles, from every potential angle or every potential like perception that you can take on the objective thing, you're gonna try and take, right? And so the, the, this, the thing is, is the person with the blue glasses on, right? They are going to see a blue smiley face, right? But here's the thing, right? The person with the red glasses on is gonna, their entire reality is gonna be filtered through red, red glasses. And so what they're going to see over here is a red smiley face, right? But then here's the thing again, because this is it, people perceive stuff in different ways. The person with the green glasses on is gonna have everything filtered through green glass. And so when they look at the easel, what's gonna happen is they are going to see a green smiley face, right? And so now we've got these three people here who are going to argue to the high heavens that what they see is correct. When in reality, objectively, the smiley face could just be black. And they're all wrong, right? So what you would need to do in this instance, right, if you were a person, I don't know if you can hear my doorbell there. I changed the doorbell to the Titanic theme tune. I thought it'd be funny, but now it just kind of annoys me and interferes with my videos, but I'm gonna keep rolling either way. This is the, um, this is the level of um, video production that you can expect with my channel. <laughs> the random Titanic doorbell start going off. Anyway, maybe you didn't hear it. Maybe I've just made it the mountain out of a molehill. But what your job here, if, if, you're, you know, if you're here in all of your high and mighty critical ability, is you need to go to everyone and say, okay, well, you know, let me put your glasses on and then let me put your glasses on, let me put your glasses on. And then eventually, you know, you're gonna take all the glasses off and see that it's black and be like, well guys, look, just take your glasses off and then you'll see, right? And so this is the thing, is you need to understand that there are multiple, multiple ways. And there's the doorbell again, bear with me. I'm gonna come back in a second. All right, very sorry about that. I had to let the cleaners in. Um, anyway, <laughs> How professional of me. So basically the point here is there are multiple ways to see the same thing. And if you're not capable of stepping into other people's shoes and seeing the argument from their perspective, from your perspective, from other people's perspectives, you're wrong, right? So when it comes to the argument of does cold email work or not, you need to look at that from the perspective of someone that hasn't made it work and someone that has made it work and maybe someone that hasn't even tried it yet, right? And then from that, you'll be able to basically triangulate those opinions and become more objective, right? Um, for example, this is another example. Um, if, if I um, started feeling down and sad and I thought I had depression, which fortunately has never happened, um, but if that did happen, 
I would go to multiple doctors and multiple psychiatrists. I would go to like five different professionals to get five different angles to judge the argument from. Because if I went to a doctor and they diagnosed me with depression and said, you need to take these pills, um, that's an argument. They would say, okay, you are depressed, so take these pills so that you don't have to be depressed anymore, right? It's like, I'm like, okay, well, how do you know I'm depressed? Well, because you said this, this, and this, so you can analyze it. But then what I would do is I would go and get other people's opinions on that thing. So I'd go to other doctors, I'd go to psychiatrists, I'd go to, you know, natural healing people, I'd go everywhere. And then from that, I would be able to have all angles of opinion. And if everyone agreed, yes, you have depression, then okay, I have depression. But if half people agreed and half people didn't, now I can actually analyze the argument and get to the bottom of it, right? So that's that. Now, the next thing is um, basically to analyze the motive, right? Um, and then this is, this is a quite important thing to do because, you know, incentive is um, one of the main things that drives um, like people lying or not lying. Incentive is just a strong reason as to why people are wrong all the time. So for example, um, you know the argument I made earlier, which I'm not actually making by the way, I'm just giving you an example, but the argument of cold email, right, doesn't work, right? So this could be an argument that someone is making online, right? And the, the problem with this is like, let's say that the person making this argument um, is selling a course on how to build YouTube for, like how to build a YouTube organic um, channel for a business, right? And their argument is cold email doesn't work because it didn't work for me, but YouTube worked for me. So we have to look at this person's motivation. We have to look at whether or not they have an incentive to actually say the thing, do they financially gain? It doesn't have to be financial, right? But what do they gain by saying this argument is true? So if they're going out into the market and saying, hey, cold email doesn't work, it's there's a strong case to be made here where cold email does work, but they're telling you it doesn't because they want to sell their course on YouTube Organic. And it's the same thing with me. I'm, I tell people cold email works because Part of my program is dedicated towards cold email, although I also teach YouTube organic as well, but I know it works because I've experimented and tested with it, but that's up, that's up to you to decide, right? You need to do critical analysis on what I say as well as everybody else. Um, and so you need to understand the motivation. Another example, right, which is super, super, super prevalent, um, is when doctors said that smoking is good for you, right? Smoking is good for your health. Right? This is what actual doctors said. People in white lab coats saying that smoking was good, right? And the, if you actually looked into this, you would find money trails to doctors being paid by smoking companies to say this. So anytime an authority figure says like something, the first place you need to look, or after judging from all angles, the first place you need to look is the motive. Because my friend who had depression, right? Well, I put, I'm not trying to colloquialize depression by doing that, but it turns out he didn't actually have depression, he just had like a bad life. My friend went to a doctor and they diagnosed him with depression. This is in America, by the way. And the, the doctor prescribing um, antidepressants like that. And it turned out, after we went through this process and analyzed this, that the doctor's like antidepressant pills, they received the biggest commission on them. We did some research. And we found out that like the doctors, and I'm not, I'm not pointing the finger at doctors and saying all doctors are bad because in the Hippocratic Oath, is, it rings pretty true, do no harm, right? But the doctor had an incentive to tell this guy to take antidepressants, right? And so the doctor couldn't really do his job objectively because the, the incentive was in the way. This is why Apple does not incentivize employees or give them commission on sales. If you go into an Apple store, all Apple store employees, all people on the sales floor are not on commission. They're on salary because Apple does not want to give um, their employees the incentive to sell customers the wrong thing. And so you need to be extremely careful here when analyzing arguments, get to the bottom of the motivation and figure out whether or not like that argument is backed by incentive, right? Um, for example, um, the Game Changers documentary on Netflix about veganism, right? Um, turns out it was sponsored by Beyond Meat or something like that. You know, if you look, you can find all these documentaries that claim that there's a specific diet that's good for you or not. Um, all of these research journals and these, pub these papers that are published on your health, they're always trying to sell a book or they're always being sponsored by a company to do this research. Same thing is true for caffeine. I don't drink coffee. Um, I've done my critical thinking on this and I think it is 
very bad for you. Um, I won't get into the, the reasons why. You can go and find them out for yourself. Trust me, there's plenty of them. But everyone right now seems to say that caffeine is amazing and caffeine is great and everything. Um, but the issue is that like, it's not because like it's literally just stimulates your nervous system, forces your body to release chemicals that indicate stress. And caffeine right now and coffee right now is where smoking was like 50 years ago. Everyone thinks it's good for you. All the doctors are publishing it. All the product, ev when everyone says something is really good, you, you should probably watch out, right? Unless they're saying that like, you know, um, even then, even then with diet, like how do we know what's true? Anyway, sorry for another day. But my point is that someone that says that coffee is good for you, like, you know, you get these productivity YouTubers that say that coffee is really good for you and then it turns out they're sponsored by a coffee machine. So you just need to be careful. Just watch out for it, okay? So the next thing is facts versus opinions. Um, and I'm also going to put in here, do, 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 number four, popularity. So facts versus opinions is a very simple one to the argument. Is, this, is someone actually, like, is the premise to support the claim and arrive at the conclusion based on an opinion or a fact. And if it is an opinion, is the opinion built on a fact? So for example, when someone says, cold email doesn't work because it didn't work for me, so YouTube organic is better. It's like, well, it, what do you mean it didn't work for you? Like how many cold emails did you actually send? What was your appointment booking rate? How many different types of copy did you experiment with? What niche did you send them in, right? These broad, broad claims that are just basically opinion pieces, not rooted in any facts, you're not going to get very far. So for example, if I say to you, cold email works, um, so you should use it by my program, that's the conclusion, right? You, you would be inclined to say, why? And I would say, well, because in the last seven years, I have sent north of 200,000 cold emails and made more than $8 million with cold email. And at present, I have 670 students all using cold email and booking one to three appointments a day with cold email. And I know it works because I've seen it work not only for me over the last seven years, but nearly a thousand other people at this point. And on top of that, I've got other people in the space who I can show you who are using cold emails to get results. Then, well, that's a pretty good argument, right? Obviously I have a motivation because I'm selling something around cold email. So there's always that thing to filter it through. But at the same time, it's like my opinion on cold email is based on fact. And so I see people in the agency space as well. This is sort of my industry. Maybe you're not in the agency industry, but people in the industry are saying cold email doesn't work. And then like, I'm like, well, why? And they're like, oh, it just doesn't, it's dead. It's like, the people will say this, like cold email is dead. It's like, okay, well, you know, why? And then they're like, oh, because it doesn't work anymore. Well, you just said the same thing. You've, you've basically backed up an opinion with another opinion. So you need to analyze this and ask yourself if opinions are rooted in facts, right? So for example, if I spoke to a peasant farmer in the 1400s who believed the earth is flat, and I said to him, hey man, um, you know, why do you think the earth is flat? He said, well, because when I look out over there, like I, I don't really, I can't see anything. Like it's just, it's just flat. That's actually quite a good argument. But the thing is, is we, we need to do all, all four of these things because if we ask the peasant farmer, he's got the fact. He's like, look, dude, I, I can't take a picture because cameras don't exist yet, but I'm telling you, if I just look out, all I see is just flatness. So the earth has got to be flat because like, how could it be anything else? Because I can't see anything else, right? But the thing is, is we would need to judge the argument from all angles. So we'd be like, okay, well, what if we can like get the angle, like I wouldn't believe the peasant farmer if I wasn't able to climb a mountain and see like the curvature or be in a plane. Obviously planes didn't exist at that point, but you get the point, right? You need to make sure you do all these things. So facts versus opinions, is someone like actually like, have they arrived at their conclusion or have they arrived at their opinion without bias or incentive by considering all angles and are they actually rooting this in fact, right? Um, another example I can give you is um, like, my diet is heavily carnival based, right? So I eat lots of red meat um, and whenever I tell someone that I eat lots of red meat, they say, well, what red meat gives you cancer, right? And it's a very common reaction to, to my diet because I eat like a ton of meat, like a ton of meat, more than m most people eat in like two months, I'll eat in like a day. and. Um, and so I'll say I eat red meat. I eat lots of red meat. I'm basically on a carnival diet. And then they'll say, well, but red meat gives you cancer, right? And then I'll say, okay, well, I, I completely hear you. I'm, I'm open to analyzing this argument. Why does red meat give you cancer? And then they'll say, oh, because, you know, like there's studies that show that it gives you cancer. And then I'll say, okay, well, specifically what studies? And they're like, well, I don't know. It's just like, you know, I, I read it, you know, it, it's, red meat gives you cancer. I'm like, okay, I hear you, dude, but like what studies? 
right? It's the same thing with people who don't like Andrew Tate, right? Now, my, my opinion on Andrew Tate, I'm pretty objective. Um, I think some of the stuff he says is good, some of it is bad. Um, but a lot of people hate Andrew Tate. And you go to them and you say, you know, you say, oh, I kind of like Tate. And then they'll be like, no, I hate Andrew Tate. And you say, hey, I completely hear you. Um, why do you hate him? Oh, because some of the stuff he says is so bad. Like some of the stuff he says is just awful towards women. And then, you know, you'll go to the person and say, okay, I, I get that. But like specifically, what has he said that you disagree with? And then they're like, oh, he's just, he's just a misogynist. Well, okay, why is he a misogynist? Oh, because he says bad things about women. Okay, well, what does he say? And then this person like isn't able to actually list things that he said. Now, I'm not saying that Andrew Tate hasn't said bad things about women, um, but my point is that like some of the stuff he has said about women is not, not good, right? There's some interviews with him, like Piers Morgan interviewing, and some of the stuff he said that I disagree with, being misogynistic and stuff. But the thing is, is like it's it's not until you actually ask someone why that that there's no foundation to their argument in any way, shape, or form. Like the red meat thing. Red meat gives you cancer. Oh, I hear you. Why do you think that? Oh, because there's studies that show that it gives you cancer. Okay, well, which study? And then the person could give a study and be like, oh, this person at this university in 2005. Okay, what were the variables for the study? Oh, I don't know. I didn't really read it. Okay, so now you're basing an opinion on nothing. Like your entire opinion of reality. This is what happens when people don't, th don't th critically think things through. Your entire orientation into the world is based on absolutely nothing. Right, and I could go, there's so many examples I could give you around this thing. Um, but like, I used to think that being vegan was the best thing in the world. And then I tried it and it completely ruined me and my body. And so now I don't think being vegan is good because I experimented with it. And so this is the thing, like I actually will test things, right? I don't just take stuff at face value because you know I watched the Game Changers documentary and I was like, this is about being a vegan. And I was like, okay, I'll give it a go. I tried it for three months, got very unwell, very sick. And then I kind of stopped and now I eat carnivore and I feel a lot better. Um, but you need to be able to release your attachment to these opinions because someone said to me like, why is, why is veganism good? And then I was like, oh, because the Game Changers documentary said so. And then I was like, oh, I'm being an idiot. Like that doesn't make any sense at all, right? So, so that's that. So the fourth thing is popularity, right? And this is basically like, is this opinion popular, right? Because I can tell you from experience that the more people put those pens on the floor. The more people that believe something to be true, the less likely it is to actually be true, right? Um, and when, when the consensus prevails, typically the idea falls apart, okay? Um, and so you need to be very careful of things that are popular and be very careful of things that authority like says because typically they can be pretty wrong. And for example, um, the housing crisis, um, the housing collapse of you know the, the 2008 financial crisis, where the entire US economy was backed up by mortgage bonds. And Michael Berry, uh, Michael Burry, um, the, one of the investors, like really smart guy, he looked at the housing market and thought, yeah, this is gonna collapse in a few years, I'm gonna short it. And at the time, everyone thought he was insane because houses were very popular and everyone was like, there's no way the housing market could fail because it's the safest. And that was an example, right? Of a lack of critical thinking, where you'd say to someone, like, what do you think of the housing market? And then they'd say, yeah, it's, it's stable and it can never fail. And then you could say, why? And then they wouldn't really have an argument as to why. They'd just be like, well, it's houses, everyone needs houses. Well, like, why does that mean it's not gonna fail, right? So Michael Berry, if you watch The Big Short, he looked at this and he was like, mm, it's kind of not going the right way. I've seen the numbers, I've seen the data. Um, and this is how people change the world, right? This is how Darwin came up with his theory of evolution. This is how like Newton, Einstein, Watson and Crick, like all these famous scientists basically just changed everything forever. Um, it's it's kind of like with, um, who was the bloke that, discovered um, penicillin. I can't remember his name. I think it was Joseph something or something. I can't remember. But the guy that discovered penicillin, like no one even knew bacteria caused disease. And then this guy just put something in a Petri dish by accident and was like, oh damn, like the disease is gone. Oh, okay, this, this might work, right? Um, and so that's that. Now, the other thing that I want to tell you is that it is possible, it is possible for two things to be true at once, right? So for example, um, you can have sort of a duality here. There's usually one better way to do something, but it is possible for two things to be true at once. So for example, um, you know, if someone says um, cold email, right? Cold email can get you clients, and someone says YouTube organic can get you clients, right? Then it's possible both of these things can work, right? And whether or not one is better than the other is up for debate. But the point here is a lot of people will just polarize to this or this. 
and I can give you a perfect example of this with client acquisition, right? Where in client acquisition, we have this um, dichotomy of quantity, right, versus quality. And there's this huge argument as to whether or not um, we should send like lots of emails or lots of messages and very few but very highly personalized ones, right? The truth is that you can get clients this way and this way. And the best thing to really do is what I call quant quality, which is where we marry them both together and we send lots of emails, but very good ones, right? Um, another example of two things being true at once could be science, right, and religion. So maybe you believe in God, right, but you also think that Darwin was right, right? Why can't it be the case that God created natural selection, right? So my point is, like, once again, I don't really have an opinion on a lot of stuff, and this channel is designed for me to be um, objective and without bias and to teach you things so that you can better understand reality without my biases of what I think is right or wrong getting in the way. Um, but it's possible for you to believe in science and to believe in religion, believe it or not. Two, things, two conflicting things can both have credence and credibility at the same time. And just because you believe heavily in one thing doesn't mean the other thing isn't right or true, okay? Um, and that's, you know, a lot of the time you have to make a decision and you have to, to sort of fall on them. But another example um, is you've got like the Democrats, right? And then in America, you've got Democrats and you've got the Republicans, right? And, you know, from my political opinion would be, well, the Democrats have some good stuff to say and the Republicans have some good stuff to say. So what probably makes the most sense here is to have a political party that marries both of these sides and has some arguments from here and some arguments from here, right? So two things can be good and true at the same time. Um, but a lot of people who are Republican hate the Democrats and a lot of people who are Democrats hate the Republicans. And the problem with this is like, when you take a side and when you form an opinion and when you get really rooted in a belief, it blinds you and you immediately restrict your ability to see 50% of the information that may have some credibility or may be useful to you, right? So just watch out for that when you're thinking critically. It's very important. And a lot of people say this, I've seen this in YouTube comments before, where I've made videos on um, all sorts of stuff, like Andrew Tate, or politics, religion, stuff like that. And I always don't take a side, right? I'm like, you know, I'll always say like, look, my opinion doesn't matter here. Like, and then people will be like, oh, he's so afraid to get canceled. And like, you know, he doesn't have any opinions so we can't trust him. And it's like, you guys, those people just don't get it. They don't get the point that it's possible to observe something without taking a side, right? And it's possible to like actually look at something without having to um, project your ego and your emotion, emotional system onto it. Um, but anyway, that's, that's the funny thing is not, not taking a side is basically taking a side if you think about it. Um, so the next thing we're gonna talk about is basically um, you need to remove, we've talked about biases and stuff. Um, there's, a, there's a few biases to remove. I'm gonna list them out to you. This is gonna be a long video by the way, but you know, we roll. Um, so the next stage to do when you're analyzing an argument, right? Because we've, we've talked about examining an argument and we've talked about um, basically how to, um, we understand the components of an argument, which is claim, premise, and um, conclusion, right? And so we understand that like, if we have the claim, right? And we have the premise here. Hi, that's okay, thank you, no worries. Sorry. Um, we have the premise, right? And then we have the conclusion, right? And then the claim kind of supports the conclusion. So we, we remember, we have the objects, right? And we have the relationships between these things. And we also kind of have the timeline because we make the claim first, we make the premise second, we make the conclusion third. So we've been able to assimilate the information, right? Um, and I've explained how to basically um, examine an argument with those four principles I just explained, um, which is judging it from all angles, right? And seeing it from different perspectives, um, examining the motive behind it. Um, what else was there? I can't even do this video's theme. My, my brain's gone. You can rewind and rewatch, but you know, all of those things, right? Um, different angles, motivation, facts versus opinions, and um, the last one that I drew in green that I could remember if we went back. But you get the point, right? We've been through all that stuff. So now, let's talk about biases. So what biases do you actually need to remove in order to make sure that you are being correct, right? And being objective. Well, the first one is authority, right? The second one is consensus. Once again, 
Um, I have to thank my mentor Sam for this information. Um, but I've been able to understand it well enough at this point in my life to teach it, and that's thanks to Sam. So thank you, Sam. Um, religion, politics, yourself, and emotion. So these are the like. There's other. There's going to be other biases, but these are the primary biases that will lead you to making a wrong decision. So authority is an obvious one. Um, you need to just operate on the premise that everyone is wrong until proven right, no matter how much authority they have. Even me with this video, you should challenge it. Challenge everything I say all the time, constantly. You, you know, if I make a statement, ask yourself why. Critically think it through. Consensus, like this means is it popular, right? Is, um, is basically like everyone, like, is it the common, is it the status quo? Is it just like tradition? Like I always say that tradition is basically peer pressure from people who are dead, right? So just because we did something ages ago, why do we have to do it now, right? Um, population, I should actually say popularity, right? Is it popular? Cultural bias, right? Just because the argument fits into the current state of the culture doesn't mean it's right because sometimes culture is wrong, right? Um, religion, just because it conflicts religion doesn't mean it's wrong. Primary example of that, Charles Darwin, natural selection, right? Or um, the Aztecs, right? When they'd sacrifice people so the sun would come up. It's kind of like, you know, like for them, it's kind of like, it's a religious argument, but we want to be careful of that. Politics, um, if it doesn't fit into a political frame, doesn't mean it's wrong. Um, yourself, if it doesn't fit your belief systems, we now know this is this is the big one, it's wrong. And the last one is emotion here, right? So just because like it makes you feel sad, doesn't mean it's right, okay? Or just because it makes you angry doesn't mean it's right or wrong. Your emotional state basically has no real indication of the honest, objective nature of the world. So now, what I'm gonna do, that's my paper down, I'm gonna freestyle the rest of this. Um, what we're now going to do is explore um, another method of thinking that concludes all of this, right? So the first step that we have to do is obviously understand, we've, we've, we've been through this, right? Understanding something is where we, you know, we have the objects, you know, and the relationships and the timeline. So we actually know what we're dealing with, right? Um, once we've understood something, we have to be able to examine something, you know, which is sort of like, you know, um, well, those, you know, we had four, four things around that, you know, which is like angles. Um, it's going to be like opinions versus facts, you know, and we had all this stuff we just talked about. Once we've understood and examined, the next thing is to question. And this is really the three step process to thinking critically, right? It's understanding what you're dealing with. It's examining the argument based on motivation, opinion, fact, popularity, and taking different angles. And then we actually question it. So up until this point, what we're doing is we're just trying to sort of gauge and examine, right? But now, before we actually have stage four, which is to decide, right? Can you see that there? I think you can. It's a little bit in the way. So, um, well, I can just draw it down there. So the third stage is to question, and then the fourth stage is to decide. So before we decide whether something is true, or before we decide how to do something, or behave on something, or integrate something into our life, or reject information, or accept an argument, or before we do anything, we have to understand, examine, and question. Because the decide thing is the easy part. <laughs> The decide thing, if, 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 I, if someone gave me an hour of time, I said this earlier about one of the famous scientists, if someone gave me an hour to like critically think through and analyze an argument or understand someone's perception and decide whether or not I wanted to integrate that into my life, I would spend probably, you know, 58 minutes, right? 58 minutes in this sort of discovery phase here because it takes a long time to break this all down. And then really the last two minutes is the decision. Because the decision is, is instantaneous. The decision will make sense and immediately manifest once you have completed these things, right? It's really just as straightforward as that. It just bang, bang, done, straight away. So the next stage is to question, right? And so in order for us to question, um, do, 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 right? So let's just draw this again. By the way, if you're still with me, I commend you because this is no this is no mean feat of a, this is no easy feat of a video to make or watch. Um, 
Nej. Okay. So we have our stages of critical thinking here. One, two, three, and four. So once we've understood, we can examine. Once we've examined, we can question. Once we've questioned, we can decide. So the question that you're looking to ask is why? So there's a framework um, in critical thinking. There's a, there's a method of thought called Socratic reasoning. And brownie points for those of you who know might come up with that one. Drum roll, please. It's going to be Socrates, right? Socratic reasoning is basically where you ask why until you get to the bottom or the root cause of the problem. Okay, so for example, you've seen me do this in live action a couple of times. If someone says red meat gives you cancer, I'd say why, and then they'd say, well, because like there's st studies that show that it like it does, and that your stomach can't digest it. Okay, why? Oh. Uh, because like it's bad for you. Okay, well, why is it bad for you? Oh, because there's studies. And then what we're looking for is we're looking to catch people into a loop here, right? And this is what people do. When they are wrong, or when they don't have the truth, or when they don't like actually understand things, what will happen is their argument will loop, right? And so this is how you know if a piece of, doesn't mean they're wrong, by the way, if someone loops information, doesn't mean they're wrong, it just means that they haven't thought through, which means their argument hasn't been critically analyzed, which means that you can't accept it as true or false, right? So by asking why five times, or as many times as you need to, either you get to a point of critical reasoning, right? Which is this thing, it's called critical reasoning, or really a first principle, right? So you get back to, you can see that one. So, by asking why enough times, we drill down and we either get to a critical point of critical reasoning or a first principle, or what happens is someone will loop. So once again, for example, red meat gives you cancer. Why? Because there's studies that show that it does. Um, okay, well, like why do the studies show that it does? Oh, because like your stomach can't digest it. Okay, well, why does why can your stomach not digest it? Because there's studies that show that it, it can. Right. That's an example of a loop. Another example would be cold email doesn't work. Um, well, why doesn't cold email work? Well, because I tried it. Um, okay, well, like, like, why didn't it work? Because you tried it. Oh, because, like, you know, people didn't respond. Oh, well, why didn't people respond? Oh, honestly, like, because, like, well, I tried it and they didn't respond, right? Just, that's another example of a loop, right? And so if, if you discover a loop in your questioning of asking why enough times, then basically the argument they have made has no credibility. It doesn't mean it's wrong, like I said, it doesn't mean it's necessarily wrong, it just means that it's not credible, that it hasn't been thought through and you shouldn't take it at face value. For example, smoking is good for you. Why? Oh, because like it stimulates your brain. Okay, why? Because this, 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 right? And you can, even with Socratic reasoning, get to a point of critical reasoning that doesn't make sense, but then you need to analyze and, and reason from up, from the first principles, right? So Socratic reasoning, um, when you do this, you're gonna piss people off, people are gonna get upset, um, but honestly, it's the fastest way to drill straight down to the root cause of a problem. So I can give you an example, right? Um, so let's say that um, you have a problem right now in your business where um, you say, I can't get clients, right? And you're like, I can't get clients. And then I'd be like, okay, well, like, why can't you get clients? Um, because like no one buys from me, right? And then I'd be like, okay, well, like, why, why aren't people buying from you, right? What's, what's going on here? And then the reason would be like, um, my offer sucks, right? And then I'd be like, well, like, why? Like, how do you know your offer sucks? Because like, people don't respond, right? People don't respond. And then I'd be like, okay, well, why? And be like, um, but then they'd be like, I don't know, really. Then he'd be like, why? And they'd be like, well, because I'm, I'm not send, I haven't emailed anyone yet. <laughs> this is kind of how it goes. They'd be like, I haven't emailed anyone. I haven't emailed anyone. So the problem is I can't get clients, but the root is because they haven't emailed anyone. So of course you can't get clients because you haven't even emailed anyone. But the problem is, is people think that it's because of their offer or because the market doesn't have the money or because people aren't gonna respond because cold email doesn't work. But the real truth is they just didn't do it. Right, another example could be um, like, you know, um, I don't know, like, yeah, once again, I, can't, I'm, I, I find it really difficult to get clients. It's like, why? Because like, well, my cold calling script doesn't work. It's like, okay, well, why not? And then they'll be like, well, because like, whenever I call people, like, it doesn't work. And it's like, okay, well, why not? 
and they'll be like, well, I, I guess I've only really spoken to like three people, but still, like it's, it's just not working. Well, why have you only spoken to three people? Because, um, well, because like, I don't really want to do it. Well, why do you really want to do it? Because honestly, like I'm kind of just like comfortable with my job right now and I'm not that bothered about the business. Well, why are you comfortable with your job? Because it's given me enough money to make what I want and I'm quite happy. So we get to the root and the real reason you're not getting clients is because you're comfortable with where you are right now. It has nothing to do with your script or anything. It has everything to do with your comfort, right? And so this is basically what we call first a first principle when you drill down through a problem by just asking why enough times and you get to the bottom of the real root cause of the problem. And I do this all the time. You know, I will do this with sales reps. I'll do this with when I'm hiring people. I do this with clients. I do it with my business partner, my friends, my family. Like if someone has an argument to make, I'll go through the, the four step, well, the, the three step process to analyze it. Um, but then it always just comes back to like, why? Why, 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 why? And then you get to the bottom of it and then you realize that their entire argument is a complete lie. And you know, this is, this is a sad thing because you could talk to like a 75 year old um, and they could say like, you know, oh, money, money doesn't grow on trees, son. Like money is scarce and you should save your pennies. I'd be like, well, why? Oh, because back in my day, like money was scarce and no one made anything. Well, why? Uh, I don't know. <laughs> and then you realize that your entire life is built off of just, I don't know, just because that's kind of how, that's how it is. Well, why is, why is it like that? Well, because that's how I've always known it to be. Well, why is it because you, why is that? Why is it why is it always what you've known it to be? Well, because my dad told me that I didn't have like money was abundant and my parents told me that like money was scarce. And they my my parents never had any money, so that's why money doesn't exist in abundance. Well, why didn't your parents have any money? Oh, because my well my grandparents told them that money doesn't exist. And then what happens is we, we develop these cycles, you know, of existence, which typically where, you know, your great grandparents tell your grandparents something and then they tell your parents something and then they tell you that thing and then you tell your kids that thing and then you know your kids tell their kids that thing and this belief system just doesn't escape the family line and your job is to sort of break this and be like well okay i didn't grow up with money or i didn't grow up with anything but that doesn't mean that that's not the way the world works it's just the way it didn't work for me or my parents Right? And so when you actually ask why, you can trace the issue or the belief system back to its core first principle, which might have just been the fact that your grandfather just didn't know what the hell he was doing. And his grandfather didn't know what he was doing either. And this is how most people live, right? So Socratic reasoning is my favorite way of thinking because A, it kind of annoys people. And there's, there's an interesting um, level of pleasure in watching someone's entire life fall apart because you ask them why. Um, it's kind of like, you know, I obviously don't, I don't get, I'm not sadistic in that sense where I get pleasure out of people's lives falling apart. I didn't mean like that, but you get the point. Yeah. Where if someone's got like a really strong argument, they really believe something and you ask them why they'll get offended. And typically if someone's offended, it's because they haven't thought through the thing and they're embarrassed and they don't want to admit to themselves or to you that their opinion and their entire life has been predicated on and oriented around a falsehood. And so if the, the older you get, the worse it gets. If you're 60 years old and you've been Republican your whole life, right? To admit that, I'm not saying Republican or the Democrat is the right way, but if you're Re Republican, well, let's just, let's, let's take politics out of it because it's always easy. If you're 60 years old and you've been a vegan, right? Um, to, uh, to admit that veganism is bad would be to admit that you've wasted your entire life or that for your entire life, you've lived a suboptimal life. And so it's more painful to admit that you're wrong and that your entire life has been a lie than it is to actually acknowledge the truth and live in a healthy way. And if you want my opinion on whether or not vegan is good or bad, I can actually give you my opinion because I've tried the vegan thing, right? I was vegan for about six months um, and it made me really unwell. It personally doesn't work for me. I'm not saying that it won't work for everyone, but for me, in my individual circumstances, with my biology and my health, I know that this diet does not work because I tried it myself for six months. I gave it like a long shot and um, it did not work, right? Um, other people, sure, whatever. But for me, I know it doesn't work. And so in conclusion, that's basically how to think critically. Um, I know that this is a long video and um, I didn't really intend for it to be this long, but hey, that's kind of the way that it goes. Um, if you are a agency owner, coach or consultant and you need help getting more clients, there's a link in the description you can click. Um, it's gonna be a video of me trying to sell you something for full transparency. Um, you may or may not feel ready for me to sell you something. So by all means, just don't click it. I don't really care either way. Um, but yeah, if you need some help getting clients, we can help you with that. We've, we're pretty good at it, but like I said,
pitch over. I don't really care. I just hope that this video is useful and it adds value. Um, so learn to think critically. Um, think like think things through, analyze arguments, understand things. So you start with understanding, then you examine, then you question, and then then you get to decide, right? I don't even think that spells decide. Dude, my brain's just like, <laughs> my brain's not working. But then, only after you've understood, examined, and questioned, do you really have the objective right to decide whether or not the, the thing that you're entertaining or the, the thing that you're dealing with is correct or false, right? Um, so that's everything. I hope you enjoyed the video. Um, have a great day, and I'll see you in the next one.